So this morning, we come to the final person that we're going to talk about who arrived at Jesus' tomb on Easter and found it empty. Of course, I'm talking about Mary Magdalene. Now, here's what we know from the biblical record. She's mentioned at least 12 times in all four Gospels. With the exception of today's reading from Luke chapter 8, all of the references to her are in conjunction with Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. I'll have more to say about the Luke 8 passage in a minute. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, she is said to have arrived at the tomb on Easter with some other women, while in John, as you heard as the scripture was read, only she is mentioned at the empty tomb. We assume that the word Magdalene refers to the town where she was born or where she lived, that is, Mary of Magdala. But quite frankly, all scholarly attempts at definitely locating a town called Magdala have been unsuccessful. Now, if you've seen the musical Jesus Christ Superstar or Mel Gibson's movie The Passion of the Christ or any other biblical bathrobe and sandals epic or read any novels about Jesus' life, you're probably surprised that I didn't mention anything about Mary Magdalene being a prostitute who repented of her sinful ways and followed Jesus. Every time Mary Magdalene is, appears in art or literature, she's usually voluptuously portrayed with a low-cut bodice and a guilty yet beatific expression on her face, indicating her sin in the world's oldest profession, now covered by the precious blood of Jesus. But there's a reason why I didn't mention anything about Mary Magdalene being a prostitute, and it's because she wasn't. There isn't one single shred of evidence anywhere in the New Testament to support such a claim. Penny says, I love doing this way too much, but I'm going ahead. <laughs> that myth about Mary Magdalene developed in the centuries following the New Testament era, and it involves a ridiculous conflating of stories and assumptions. So let me see if I can unpack this a little. You see, all four Gospels tell different versions of the story that Lois preached about last week. You remember the story of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with the expensive bottle of perfume and then wiped his feet with her hair. Now, if we were honest, we would have to admit that that story has a, is a very intimate action with definite sexual overtone. So that's where we get started on this. In Luke's version of that story, he calls the woman a sinner. And because even we Christians have dirty little minds, early biblical interpreters immediately assumed that that meant prostitute. It could have meant any number of things, but everybody went immediately to prostitute. Only John's gospel gives the woman a name. He calls her Mary, who in the context of John's story is obviously the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And so Christians began to think that Lazarus' sister and Mary Magdalene must have been the same. Never mind the fact that Mary lived in Bethany, not some place called Magdala. Ergo, Mary Magdalene must have been the sinner that's mentioned in Luke's gospel. And when Luke says Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene, isn't it obvious that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute? Come on. The notion that Mary Magdalene was a penitent prostitute is baloney. All we know about Mary Magdalene is that she was among that group of women who followed Jesus and took care of him and his disciples. She was present at Jesus' crucifixion, and she was the first, or at least among the first, to find his tomb empty on Easter morning. Oh, yeah, and there's that stuff about seven demons being cast out of her, too. What are we to make of that? Well, seven is the number in the Bible that symbolizes completeness. So I think Luke is telling us that her suffering was terrible, about as bad as any human being can stand. And demons are mentioned many times in the gospel stories. And if you want to, you can take those references right ahead to the movies like The Exorcist and that sort of stuff. But if you're like I am... You can count on the fingers of one hand with five fingers left over 
The number of times you've seen somebody's eyes roll back in their heads and their voice drop about two octaves while they curse you and hail Satan. No, when I think about demons, I think about the shadows that haunt me. I think about the addictions I just can't seem to shake. I think about the poor decisions I've made that still jerk my life around. I think about the fears that rise up in the night and keep me awake. If you were here a few weeks ago, you saw the video about a chalkboard that was put on a New York street with the words, write your biggest regret. And people stopped by all day long and wrote things on that chalkboard like, not applying to med school, or not following my artistic passion, or playing it safe, or always settling for plan B. Those are the types of demons I know. And I choose to think they're the kind of demons Mary Magdalene fought too. For whatever reason, her life was dominated by demons of fear or self-hatred or regret or depression or any number of dark forces. And there were at least seven of them tormenting her. I can only imagine how troubled she must have been. Mary Magdalene did not need to be a fallen woman to have demons dogging her. In fact, she must have been the exact opposite in order to have so many shadows tempting her. The more strength she had, the more openings there were for demons. You you know that to be true, right? You know that's how it works. You know that temptations come to us at a point of strength, right? The common misconception is that demons rush into our lives at a point of weakness, but that's not true. Demons afflict us at a point of strength. Wherever we feel the strongest, wherever we think we've got things nailed down, wherever we are most confident, that's where we're vulnerable to temptation. I heard about a sticker plastered on the wall of a public telephone booth that read, If you're tired of sin, read John 3.16. Underneath it, somebody had scrawled in their own handwriting, If you're not tired of sin, call 555-1176. Maybe that was Mary Magdalene's phone number. I don't know. (laughs) Temptation comes at a point of strength, not weakness. Now, I have to confess, I succumbed to temptation at a point of strength the last time I was back home in Georgia. Driving along the bridge that spans the Chattahoochee River in my hometown of Roswell, Georgia, when I spotted a man perched on the edge of the bridge about to jump to his death. Well, being the trained professional that I am with impeccable counseling skills, I stopped the car, I got out, and I yelled, hey, why do you want to kill yourself? And he says, I have nothing to live for. And I said, well, that can't be true. Think of your wife and your children. And he said, I don't have any wife or children. I said, well, think about your mom and dad. He said, they've been dead for years. And I said, well, then at least think about General Robert E. Lee. And he said, who's Robert E. Lee? So I pushed him. No, that didn't happen. It's a joke. (laughs) But here's a story that's not. I used to take great pride in my skills as a preacher and a pastor. I thought I was pretty good at both. I mean, the evidence seemed plain to me. Most of my congregants loved me. People were constantly telling me how much my preaching meant to them, and they were always quoting parts of my sermons to friends and relatives. Chicago Theological Seminary invited me to teach in their Doctor of Ministry and Preaching program. My family life revolved around the rhythms of Sunday and the interruptions of weddings and funerals. And then one day, after both my girls had gone off to college, my wife told me she wanted out of our marriage. When I asked her why, she said, it's always been hard to walk in your shadow. I was doing so well as a pastor. I missed my marriage coming apart at the seams. Now, granted, in any divorce, there's enough blame to go around, but I recognize my own culpability. 
where I was the strongest. That's where I was most vulnerable. The demons of this world don't look for the soft spots in our psyches. They look for the sturdiest places because that's where we let down our guard. Maybe that's why the crowd around Jesus on Palm Sunday shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, morphed so quickly into the mob shouting, crucify him, just a few days later. Their unexamined exuberance gave the demons the open, just the opening they needed. I don't know where Mary Magdalene felt the strongest, but I'm sure her demons exploited those openings until she met Jesus. Somehow Jesus helped her get rid of those seven demons tormenting her days and nights. No wonder she joined that company of women following Jesus. I can only imagine the gratitude she felt for her deliverance, and I can only imagine the pain shooting through her heart as she watched Jesus agonizing death on the cross. Did she fear the return of her demons? Did she think the absence of Jesus would be the opening they needed to torment her again? Maybe that's why when she finally recognized Jesus on that resurrection morning, she wrapped her arms around him and clung to him as if her life depended on it. Maybe if she held on to him tight enough, the shadows wouldn't cross her life again. But Jesus knew that was a t waste of time and energy. Clinging to him would only bring a false sense of security. Mary was going to have to face those demons rather than avoid them. And so Jesus said, don't hold on to me, Mary. Focus your attention on the life open to you now. Not the life you had before. And start by going to my disciples and tell them, I am risen You see, running away from your demons only makes them stronger. Finding a place to hide, even in the folds of Jesus' robe, only makes you more vulnerable. Sooner or later, those demons have to be faced and embraced. The other day, Kathy Jurgens, whom most of you know, posted on Facebook. I don't know what you call those, that a meme or a sign. I'm not sure what you call it. But it said, sometimes I wrestle with my demons. Sometimes we just cuddle. <laughs> Maybe that's why Jesus told Mary Magdalene to let go of him. There's a time to wrestle with demons and there's a time to embrace them. If they victimize us at a point of strength, then the best way to master them is to face them and embrace them. By embracing those good parts of ourselves in the light of Christ's resurrection, the powers of darkness can have no control over us anymore. I saw a cartoon that showed a therapist talking to a woman, and the therapist said, Tina, in, over, in order to overcome your fear of physical intimacy, I really urge you to embrace your demons. And Tina says, embrace them? Couldn't I just shake their hands? Well, no, Tina, that's not how it works, you see. In order to master your demons, you have to embrace your demons. In order to reach the sun, you don't run west into the fading light. You run east into the darkness where the sun will reappear. Jesus made it possible for Mary Magdalene to do that. His resurrection made it possible for her to continue to master her demons. And whatever demons, whatever fears, whatever regrets... Whatever shadows are haunting you this morning, the risen Christ can give you the strength to face them, embrace them, and rob them of their power to torment you anymore. Whether there are seven of them nipping at your heels or a hundred and seven. Some of you may recall the story about a young man in Italy many years ago. His name was Giovanni. Giovanni was the son of a wealthy cloth merchant, and he lived the high life of a worldly young man of the upper class. 
As any man of means was expected to do in that day, he enlisted in the army to fight for his hometown and his privileged way of life. And one day, as Giovanni rode his horse to join the fight, dressed in full armor, he came upon a man standing in the road, blocking his way. Giovanni thought the man would move to keep from being trampled, but he didn't move. He rode closer, thinking the man would see his military attire and his patrician bearing and move out of the way as the inferior. But the man didn't move. As Giovanni drew closer, he saw the man's features more clearly, and now his heart skipped a beat. There was no mistaking the man's rotting flesh and the stench from his ragged clothes. The man was afflicted with leprosy. Giovanni recoiled in horror. Leprosy was the Ebola virus of his day, and he was petrified of being stricken with the disease, would do anything to avoid coming into contact with it. So Giovanni yelled, step aside. But the man didn't move. He yelled again, step aside. But the man stayed where he was. And then, purely on an impulse, Giovanni climbed down from his horse and walked over to the leper and held out some money. The leper took the coins from his hand but still said nothing, still did not move. Then Giovanni took the finely woven cape from around his shoulders and he wrapped it around the shoulders of the leper. Again, the leper did not speak and he did not move. And then from some store of strength that he didn't even know that he had, Giovanni cradled that man's head in his hands and he brought that face toward him and he kissed him on those rotted, leprous lips. Then Giovanni turned and climbed back on his horse and when he looked at the road again, it was empty. The leper was nowhere to be seen. Now, who knows whether that story is true in the sense that our culture defines true. But here is something indisputable. Giovanni turned his horse around and rode back to his hometown where he resigned from the army. He abandoned his worldly life, gave up his entire fortune and became known to everyone and known to all of us all these centuries later as St. Francis of Assisi. During this holiest of weeks, embrace your demons. Embrace your fears. Embrace your regrets. Embrace the shadows that haunt you. Kiss them on their rotted lips. And when the light of the empty tomb shines on you, they just might be gone. or at least a little more tame.